My colleague Christine Johnson will be joining us shortly. At the moment, we're learning more about the charges against the man suspected of bombings in New York and New Jersey, exactly what he will face. 28-year-old Ahmed Khan Ramami will be charged on five counts of attempted murder and two gun charges. U.S. officials also tell CBS News that Rahami recently traveled to Afghanistan, the country where he was born. Officers arrested him this morning after a shootout in Linden, New Jersey. And our justice reporter, Paula Reed, is in Washington. She's been following this. Paula, if I'm watching this at home and I hear uh, five uh, counts of attempted murder and two gun charges, I'm thinking to myself, huh? I thought this was a terrorism case. It is certainly a terrorism case. Officials were very clear at a press conference earlier today that this is no doubt a terrorism case and it will be a terrorism prosecution. But for now, they've said that they're going to let the local officials charge him so that he will remain behind bars while federal prosecutors prepare what they describe as a comprehensive terrorism case. This is a very common tactic, especially in terrorism uh, cases. They often don't want to reveal all of their evidence, so they'll try to hold a suspect on a minor charge. Certainly attempted murder is not a minor charge at all, but here they have the luxury of being able to charge him on state charges, so they don't have to reveal really any of their federal terrorism evidence until they're ready to do so. Uh, people waking up to a morning paper this morning or to something in their inbox probably saw that picture of the street in New York City with all the little markers, the law enforcement markers, or every little piece of evidence was uh, on 23rd Street. A lot of work being done to bring this case. How much time do you expect between where we are now and when federal charges could come? Probably in a matter of weeks, days or weeks. The most important thing, one of it's the physical evidence, certainly that you referenced, but it's also any sort of surveillance or any conversations or communication that the feds have picked up. Oftentimes when they don't want to reveal all of their evidence is because they don't want to tip other potential suspects to exactly how they were monitoring the suspect that they do have. So frequently you see this in cases where they'll charge someone on a lesser charge at first so they don't have to reveal all their evidence. They can continue their surveillance. They can watch other people. They can gather more evidence before they indict that person and then have to reveal publicly what they have to support those charges. And now here's a question with both strategic importance but also interpersonal importance. We have a suspect who is accused of bombings in New Jersey and also New York. Two separate districts, two separate prosecuting teams. A big case here. Are they fighting over it? Who's going to take precedence? Are they both going to charge? What are you expecting? Well, I would expect that they're certainly fighting over it, even if they don't say so publicly. <laughs> Things like this, this is a career-making case. You get a lot of resources, and not that many cases like this come down the pike. Uh, it's very rare to have someone who carries out a successful terrorist attack on U.S. soil and lives to be charged. So I'm sure the states of New Jersey and New York are both vying for this. It is more likely that the Southern District of New York uh, in Manhattan, that that prosecutor, Preet Bharara, will receive the case because he had dozens of injuries in his district where the other two bombs did not result in injuries. So it is more likely that it'll go to the Southern District of New York, but it's a fascinating science, sort of art, I guess you might say, uh, when these big high profile cases come, how Maine Justice, the mothership here in Washington, decides who gets them. But my money would be on the Southern District of New York. The Southern District. You know, another remarkable thing about this, this young case is the, the fact that we're watching video of the terror suspect on a stretcher alive, captured in the aftermath of what authorities say are multiple bombings and attempted bombings. How unusual is it to have a terror suspect alive and well on American soil after the attempt? It's really unusual, especially for a successful terror attack. After 9-11, uh, they changed the laws so that it would be easier for prosecutors to find people before they carried out these attacks. So most of the cases that we see are people who were plotting something but didn't actually execute their plan. There have, of course, been successful terror attacks on U.S. soil, some just in the last year. We saw in San Bernardino and Orlando, but none of those suspects, one associate, but none of those suspects lived to be charged. There was, of course, one of the Sanaya brothers and also Major Nadal Hassan in Texas. However, Major Nadal Hassan went through the military court system, not the federal Department of Justice court system. So it's incredibly rare. These are career making cases and this one appears to be a slam dunk given all the surveillance video that they have and all the evidence that they have to support this. All right, Paula, Paula Reed in Washington for us. Thank you very much, Paula.